Would you hold, please? Good morning, Mr. Marshall. Good morning. Uh, Mr. Cameron's expecting you. Would you like to come in, please? Thank you. Don't we even get to know which Cameron? Unless otherwise designated, it's David. Hello, oh, Owen. Come in. Hello, David. Claire. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, Owen. Do you know Danny Paterno? Uh, no. How are you? Sir? I love the way those names echo across your door. By the way, where is the newest member? Um, getting some documents we'll probably need. David, are you feeling all right? Of course. Sit down, won't you? Uh, Owen, Clark is going to be coming up for a visit today. His schedule's been pretty jammed up for the last few months. <laughs> I can imagine. Hello, Polly. Oh, hello, Owen. Many congratulations. Thank you. Danny, this is the Cameron of Cameron, Cameron, and. The only thing she's done recently is graduate first in her law school class and edit the review. I'm intimidated. How's Ruth Ann? She's fine. Well, shall we get to this? Uh... Mr. Cameron, Jess and company would like to discuss the possibility of uh, reserving 50,000 shares of stock. Now, what is this? Either a merger is agreed upon or it isn't. Well, in, in principle... You come in here at this stage and start asking for discussions and... I'm so sorry. Excuse me. I, uh, I'd like to apologize. There's no need, Blair. If your father's not feeling well, we can do this another time. I'd like to explain. Owen, oh, I know how long you've been a friend of the family. See, the, the reason to add, uh... It's Mom. Is she ill? We, uh... We got the diagnosis the day before yesterday. We brought her back from the hospital. Uh, she has a, a malignancy. It's so widespread, there's nothing that they can do. Oh, I'm so very sorry. For all of you. So she's going to die. They're a remarkable family. Ruth Ann herself is a writer. She's been published in several national magazines. And the daughter-in-law, that's Blair's wife, she's a physician. She's serving her residency at Valley Memorial. And, of course, you know who Clark is. No. I thought you were into all that. You mean Clark Cameron, the singer? Oh. Middle child. That's funny. Coming from that family, and he's not a lawyer. As a matter of fact, he is a lawyer. Is he really? Well, at least he graduated from law school and practiced for a few months until he finally admitted that he much preferred playing the guitar and singing. But he caused a few waves in the legal profession while he was still here. Like what? Well, there was a fellow up in Hanover multimillionaire who left a lot of money in his will to build the town a huge industrial museum. And the only condition was it was to be called the Willard P. Hudson Memorial Center. His name didn't happen to be Willard P. Hudson, did it? You've heard the story. Oh. Well, Clark decided that the town needed that building about as much as it needed smog. 
And when Clark feels strongly about something, he's not the type to sit around and meditate. What did he do? He went into court and applied to have his own name legally changed. His own name? That's right. He wanted his name changed to the Willard P. Hudson Memorial Center so he could refuse to let the town use his name. <laughs> That's beautiful. The judge uh, couldn't have taken him seriously. No, the petition was denied. But it had the effect of mobilizing the people in the town, and they finally went to the heirs of the Hudson estate and got them to uh, subsidize a hospital instead. Oh, wow. Now, this man I think I would like. I guarantee you would. She looks much too young. Oh, Clark. <laughs> Marvel, we've missed you. Why? Still need me to show you how to burn toast properly? I was taking it into your mother. How is she, Rachel? Bless her heart. She's just like a rock. I'll take this in. It's so good to have you home. Anybody here order a pizza? Yes. Cheese, mushrooms, and strawberries. Oh, darn. I, I always foul up these exotic orders. I forgot, forgot the, the cheese. cheese. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, gorgeous. How have you been? Missing you a lot. Tell me some good things. Well, my new album's selling well. With all those dirty lyrics, how could it miss? They are not dirty. They're honest and unashamed. They're dirty. And you are a vicious woman. <laughs> More good things. Well, got a big concert tour coming up in the fall. Oh, important things. Like, uh, how are your teeth? I've decided not to have an eagle tattooed on my forehead. How's that? I'm crushed. <laughs> and what about you? Oh, my medication fuzzies my brain a little. And I'm insulted to discover that nobody seems to tell the difference. Outside of that, I... Dad told you, of course. Yes. Thank you. Well, at first I was pretty shocked. Seemed like a stinking thing to happen to a marvelous person like me. But then I took another look. And what did you see? That I've had 52 years of absolutely everything I wanted. The love of a man I adore. And a fine home, productive work. And especially you and Blair and Polly. How many people have even one year like that? How's your love life? Oh, I... I find them off with clubs. You know, I was talking about you not 20 minutes ago. You and Blair. Repeatable? Mm. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Our fine family doctor stopped by. And we were talking about the time you boys... Is the legal cavalry home? Well, it is Clark. I thought that thing outside belonged to the Schreiders Parade. <laughs> Hi, Tyke. Mm, Hi, famous brother. Hi, pal. What thing outside? Oh, Clark always maintained he'd never go in for flashy cars, no matter how big a bundle he made. So he bought himself a truck. A truck? Clark. A $17,000 truck. <laughs> Just a simple man of the soil. That's me. 
How are you feeling? <laughs> Wonderful. Good. Uh, you don't suppose that has anything to do with the rifle of number two son, do you? Who? What's his name? Mm -hmm. Hey, you don't look like any lawyer I've ever seen. Give her five minutes in the courtroom. You'll be convinced. She'll tear you out. Kid's good, huh? Terror. Absolute terror. I have a request. I adore having you all here, but I happen to be feeling sleepy, and at this point, I think I'd adore you even more in the den. They say it could be as long as four or five months, but it's unlikely. I was thinking on the way up, maybe I should cancel everything I've got scheduled and, and move back in. No, I wouldn't, Clark. You see, the thing Excuse is that... Excuse me, uh, Mr. Cameron. I just wanted to find out if Blair's staying for dinner. Yes, if it's all right, Rachel. Wynn's working the late shift at the hospital this week. Polly, would you mind seeing if your mother needs anything before I serve dinner? Sure. You were saying I shouldn't move back in? Well, I'm just afraid that you'd be an everyday reminder of what's happening. She'll worry about your work. She'll feel guilty. Guilty? Well, son... You know your mother. Well, maybe it'll be over quickly. I think what we have to do is try to keep things as normal as possible. Dad! <laughs> Vinovich's coming out. Did he tell you anything? Uh, why don't you let him explain it to you? Clark? Here he is. Her condition is extremely critical. I don't understand. I thought she had uh, a couple of months. Well, the fact is, this has nothing to do with the malignancy. What do you mean? She's suffering from a severe overdose of sedatives. No. No. We're doing our best to keep her alive. No, don't. What? Don't keep her alive. Clark, what are you saying? Well, obviously, she made the decision. It's, it's what she wanted. We have to respect that. No, no. She didn't make any decision. It, it was an accident. It had to be. Come on, Blair. Uh, gentlemen, this argument is meaningless. Now, it's my duty to try to save her life, and I intend to... Your duty is to do what's best for her. And what's best is not to sentence her to months of agonizing pain. Clark, don't. Come on, Polly. You know I'm right. She made the choice. I'm sorry. She's dead. Marshall's office. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, he isn't in yet. Oh, um, well, can you hold for a moment, please? Excuse me, Mr. Marshall, David Cameron is on the phone. He says it's urgent. I'll take it. Are you going to eat that bacon? No, you can have it. Chubby. Hello, David. Owen? I need your help. I've killed Ruth Ann. Those were having cocktails. I went back to her room and I did it. Where'd you get the drugs? Well, there was a bottle by her bedside. How many did you give her? A handful. How'd you give them to her? What? A handful of pills. How'd you get her to take them? I, uh... Oh, come on, David. Let's stop this nonsense. You didn't do any such thing. No, please, I now, did. Now, look, you're an attorney. You honestly think those answers would stand up for more than ten seconds? I just don't know what to do. Mr. Cameron, what makes you so sure your wife didn't take the drugs herself? No, she wouldn't. Not without telling me. Not without... saying goodbye. You both see the truth. Someone in our house did it. And I want to accept the responsibility. 
I don't want any of the children to have to pay for what I'm sure they thought was an act of mercy. Well, the fact is, David, that's an option you don't have and you know it. I'm 55 years old. What happens to me is certainly not as important as what happens to them. Now, look, I don't want you talking with anyone else about this from now on. Outside the family or in. Not until we get more facts about Ruth Ann's death. There's one thing we're sure of. The drug was originally in capsule form, but she didn't take any capsules. How do you know? Well, there was a juice glass by her bed, which contained remnants of the drug. That means the capsules were open and the powder was poured into the juice. Excuse me a minute. You guys want anything? No, thank you. Um, this is my lunch. Charlie, hold it. The drug was in the juice. Now, you figure that that rules out suicide? I mean, don't you? Why not uh, just take the capsules? Now, we figure that somebody gave her the, the drug and uh, didn't want her to know she was taking it. Oh, wow. Oh, these things must have been on the rack since the Truman administration. Do you know what the drug was? Yeah, it's ephemeral. It's a sedative, painkiller, dreamboat. Her own prescription? Yep. Doctor put her on it about three weeks ago. And do you know if there was enough of the stuff around to kill her? There is a problem. What? Well, so far as we can determine, the last refill was two weeks ago, before her hospitalization, 24 capsules. Well, that doesn't sound so many. It's not. Doctor passes them out a few at a time because they're very powerful and they're very dangerous. How many is she supposed to take every day? Three. And when you consider the kind of pain that she was in, it's very difficult to imagine that she wouldn't take her complete dosage. Well, then there shouldn't have been enough left to kill her. I agree with you. And I don't have an answer. And here is something which I think completely rules out any idea of suicide. What is it? She was writing an account of her dying. She hoped it might be helpful to someone in the future who had to face the same thing, make them feel a little less lonely. It's very moving, very eloquent, it's very short. So unfortunately, that someone in the future is not going to benefit from it. Because somebody decided he was God. Charlie, you don't yet know what happened. You read that. And you tell me if those are the words of somebody thinking about committing suicide. You've been at this too long to jump at conclusions. Well, then you give me a conclusion that makes sense. I know that whoever did this probably thought he was being merciful. But so far as I'm concerned, there is no such thing as mercy killing. It's a contradiction in terms. Well, the law agrees with you on that. You bet it does. When I find out who did this, I'm going after him like he was an axe murderer. Because so far as the law is concerned, he's no better. He's up in Sacramento and he couldn't get down, but he sent you his love. Thank you. For school? Oh, I thought I was doing all right, and then trusts came along, and I think it's going to do me in. I've got some notes. Maybe they'd help. Thanks. Oh, look, there's Jess. Hello, Polly. Jess. Oh, and I need to talk with you. Excuse us. What's the matter? Uh, Charlie Gianetta called. He's ready to move. Already has a warrant. He called me because he didn't like the idea of sending police out here today. I said I'd come out and bring him in. Who, Jess? Hark? First degree murder. On what evidence? What evidence could they possibly have? Well, Charlie says they found your fingerprints on the glass. On the... Well... Yes, I guess I handed her the glass. Uh, she reached for it, and I was closer, so I just handed it to her. Were mine the only prints? Well, the others were smudged, unreadable. What about the time factor? I mean, surely that well, can prove... The doctors can't pinpoint it precisely, but they say your mother took the drugs sometime between 4.30 and 6 p.m. But that means it could have happened any time from a half hour before I got there and 
until a half hour after the others got home. Well, were any of the others alone with her in the room during that time? I don't know. The way the house is laid out, you can't see anything from the living room. You know that. I mean, anybody who went down the hall to the bathroom could have gone into her room, but... Never mind. Forget I said that. Why? Look, when I talk like that, it sounds like I'm trying to pin it on someone else in the family. And I don't want to do that. Well, we have to try to figure out what happened. Owen, I would never have done it. I, I couldn't have. Still, I'm, I'm glad she won't have to suffer. I, I admit that. But I have no great compulsion to find out who did it. I, I'm willing to let just whatever happens happen. Well, what happens just could be you spending the rest of your life in prison. What am I supposed to do? Well, I'll tell you what you're not supposed to do. You're not supposed to take the blame for what someone else did. First your father and now you. And you both know better. Now, there's only one way for this matter to be resolved morally. And that's for the facts to be determined in a court of law. The facts, Clark. Whatever they are. I understand that the bail was set so high because of the seriousness of the charge. Yes. I hope I haven't insulted you. I have to keep reminding myself you're a member of the club. Everything go all right? Fine. Good. Owen, everybody's out back. Come have a drink. Oh, I don't think you need company right now. I think that's exactly what we need. Please. All right. Hi, gang. Owen, scotch all right for you? Fine, thank you. Mr. Marshall, how long is it going to take to straighten all this out? Well, there's a preliminary hearing set for the 16th. Just what is that? The DA has to show there's sufficient evidence to warrant binding a person over for trial. Hey, you do sound a little bit like a lawyer at that. Claire, can I get you anything? No. So it should all be over on the 16th. Well, I suppose there'll be an army of your fans ready to celebrate outside the courthouse. Clark. Yeah, Blair? Everybody's assuming you're going to be set free because you're innocent. So? I haven't heard you say it. Say what? That you didn't do it. I didn't. Okay. Well, did you really have to ask? Yes. Yes, I really had to ask. I mean, it's great to see the clan rally round, but I don't want anybody to forget one very important thing. Somebody murdered our mother. Blair, in the name of heaven! Well, that's what it was, wasn't it? Somebody took her life. Somebody robbed her of days, months... Of terrible pain! Blair! And also, perhaps, some of the most precious moments she ever would have known, Polly. And she won't know them now, will she? Now, please. We need each other now. Let's not get into this. I think we have to get into this. Clark says he's innocent. All right, I'll accept that for now. And I'll help in any way I can. But I want everybody to understand one thing. If the courts decide you're guilty, from that day on, I don't have any brother. Why didn't you ask me to do that? I'm a reformed male chauvinist. Oh, I was a championship cheese server. Now my feelings are hurt. How do you like competing in the cold world, Frida Baby? Hey, you know something? I don't see that they got enough to make this stick. I don't know. Motive, opportunity, attitude, and the fingerprints. Yeah, but except for the fingerprints, there's really little more to their case than could be made against most of the others. I mean, just consider the list of those we know were in Ruth Ann's room that day. David, Polly, Blair, Rachel Minifee, Dr. Vinever. Scratch Vinever. Well, why was he on the list in the first place? Clark remembered his mother saying that the doctor had just left. Did Vinever deny being there? Oh, no, he was there, all right, but uh, he was gone by late in the morning. He was out of there before 11.30. According to? Him, Rachel, his office staff. Well, why did Mrs. Cameron say that? Well, we know that the medication was fuzzing her brain, and I suppose her sense of time could have been affected. Yeah, I suppose that's true. You know, Rachel would have had just as much opportunity as Clark. Exactly. 
Well, did Gianetta investigate her? Oh, of course. But he's convinced that she's too much the loyal employee. She'd never take a step like that on her own. Wait a minute, though. Now, Blair's wife is a doctor, supposing that Ruth Ann was referring to her. Smart girl. Well, why not? I mean, suppose the mother-in-law was making a flippant remark. You know, I like that idea so much that I discussed it with Charlie yesterday. So? Well, Wynn was on duty from 10 in the morning at the hospital, worked straight through the whole day. Besides, how could she kill Ruth Ann to spare her physical pain and then keep silent while Clark's entire life is being destroyed? Well, that problem exists no matter who did it. I suppose one possibility is that no one else came forward because there is no one else. You mean he's guilty? Uh, listen, we don't have time for another full take of this monster hit, so let's take our ten-minute break now. Ugh. Come on, let's get out of this closet, huh? <sighs> I gotta tell you, I'm not exactly objective. Now, how's that? Well, in the first place, there's a lot of bread involved. Clark Cameron's going to sell an awful lot of records. And I'm going to produce those records if... If he's not in prison. Yeah. I've heard the acoustics at San Quentin cause a few problems. So besides that, I like him. Hey, everybody seems to. Literally everybody. And you realize how rare that is in the music business? It happens about as often as blizzards in Beverly Hills. But that's just the kind of guy he is. Well, tell me this. Uh, do you think he's the kind of guy who could... Do what he's accused of. Oh, man, how can I know anything about what happened? Well, do you know anything about it? No, of course not. Well, then, could you answer my first question? Is he that kind of man, do you think? What? You just want my opinion? That's all. Hey, man, I, I hardly know the guy. I'm trying to find out all I can about him. Okay. Yeah, it's possible. Why? Well, it's just that I know he's the type of guy that feels deeply. And I know he's the type that acts on the basis of those feelings. Not exactly what you wanted to hear, is it? Uh, no, not exactly. You see, I say something like that in court, and I just wind up scoring points against Clark, and that's the last thing I want. Hey, don't worry. I doubt if we'll have any reason to call you. Oh, yeah, but uh, what if I'm called by the prosecution? What makes you think that that would happen? Well, I got a call from a Mr. Gianetta. I'm meeting with him tomorrow. And I assume he'll be asking me some of the same questions you've asked. That's a fair assumption. Thanks for coming, Blair. Did you think I wouldn't? Doctor, wouldn't that much of the drug in a glass of juice affect the taste? Do you mean enough that uh, she would suspect there was something in the drink? Yes. No. Difemerol is practically tasteless. It has a slight acid quality, but I would say one wouldn't notice it in orange juice. Thank you. Your witness. No questions, Your Honor. Well, what I mean is I, I can't be sure. Oh. So it is possible that someone could have come into the house, visited Mrs. Cameron's room, and left without you knowing that they were there. Yes, sir, I'd say that's possible. No further questions, Your Honor. Redirect, Mr. Gianetta. Just one, Your Honor. This is Minipi. It's also possible that someone had entered That's Rick Schenk, who just came in. I got a message to call him last night, but he was gone when I called back. I wonder if Charlie is... Really going to try to introduce character testimony in a preliminary hearing? It looks that way. Well, with the jury, it might mean something, but the judge is only looking at evidence. Were you with the accused at any time during the day preceding the death of his mother? I don't know where he's going. Yes, I was. Uh, we had a meeting to discuss material for his next album. Where did the meeting take place? At my office on Sunset Boulevard. 
And what happened after the meeting? Well, my car was in for repair work, and uh, Clark offered me a lift. Could you uh, describe his mood on that day? Uh, he was very down. Like I've never seen him before. Did you ask him if anything was wrong? No. Uh, I figured he'd tell me if he wanted to. Later on, I added it all up and figured out that it was because he'd just found out about his mother's condition. That's, that's true. Did he take you straight to the, uh, to the garage? No. Uh, he had to make a stop at a market. Did you go in the store with him? No, I waited in the truck. What'd you do while you were waiting? Uh, uh, there's a lot of gadgets in the truck, and I spent the time looking them over. All right, while you were uh, looking them over, did you happen to look into the glove compartment? Oh, man, I never intended to tell anybody. He was asking me questions, and it just came out. Would you please tell the court if you looked inside the glove compartment, and if so, what you found inside? Oh, no. I found a bottle of caps. You mean capsules? Drug capsules? Yeah. Approximately how many of them would you say were in the bottle? I don't know. Fifty or so, I guess. Would you describe the capsules, please? Red and white. Were they like this? I, I can't be sure. It's possible, I guess. Your Honor, the article I'm holding is a 10 milligram capsule of difemeral. This is the drug that Dr. Venever testified killed Ruth Ann Cameron. Blair. Honey, wait. You heard what he said. He lied to us. He killed her. Blair, please. Your Honor, may we please have a recess? Very well. We will recess for 30 minutes. Do you deny that you placed the bottle of capsules in the glove compartment? No, sir. I put them there. And would you please tell the court where you secured them? I didn't secure them. I, I found them. Where? They were in a music case, a case that holds the arrangements for my backup group. Would you explain the circumstances, please? Well, I, I wanted to look at the charts, the arrangements. I had an idea for a change that I wanted to make. And uh, I went down to the R&E offices, which is where we keep the stuff when we're not on the road. I opened up the case, and I found a bottle underneath a piece of music on the side. And what was your reaction? I've always tried to keep my group clean of drugs, and I felt like one of the guys had betrayed me. And so what did you do about it? At first, I wanted to go to the police and have the bottle checked for fingerprints. That's how angry I was. And did you do that? No, sir. Uh, after a while, I cooled off a bit. I, I decided that I was overreacting. I decided to warn the guys as a group and give whoever was responsible another chance. Meanwhile, I, I shoved the bottle in the glove compartment. I mean, I, I couldn't very well carry it around in my pocket. Do you still have the capsules? No, sir. When I got home, I flushed them down to John. Would you have any idea whether the capsules were, in fact, diethemeral? No, I wouldn't. It's possible, I suppose, but there are a lot of drugs that come in red and white capsules. That's really what happened. I know how lame it sounded, but it's the absolute truth. Oh, well, we'll have you back on the stand in the morning. Maybe we can reinforce your testimony. Dad? Hmm? Thanks for coming back, Holly. You didn't think that... Clark, Wynn wasn't feeling well. She asked me to go with her. That's all. Oh, I guess I'm getting paranoid. I'm sorry, Tyke. What's the matter with Wynn? She's in the hospital. What? She's all right. She, uh, she had a miscarriage. Oh, Polly. I didn't even know she was pregnant. None of us did. Blair told her not to tell any of us yet. I guess there's not much left of that marvelous family communication we used to have. Come on, son. We'll see you tomorrow. What a shame. Family's been heavy enough without this. Mm-hmm. Something the matter? Why would the person who did it keep quiet? We still haven't been able to figure that one out. You have an idea? I just may. It's a wild guess, but it makes as much sense as anything else. When was this, Doctor? Well, I wonder then, do you remember how long it was before she died? Well, about how long? I see. 
Did you say was or wasn't? Yes, I'm sure. Well, you've been most helpful, Dr. Hardiman, and I appreciate your taking the time. Yes, very important. It could mean a man's life. Thank you very much, Doctor. Goodbye. From one side of the conversation, it sounded promising. So far, it fits. I'd say our next stop is a hospital. I'd say you're right. Very sorry to hear about what happened. Well, we'll have other chances. <laughs> oh, and I uh, like to apologize for my behavior in court today. Not to me. I just can't tell you how I felt. I heard that testimony and realized that Clark had actually done it. Clark didn't do it, Blair. Well, that can. No, I don't even want to get into it again. It's. Uh... You should believe in him. It's your job. It's also my very deep conviction. Where else could those drugs have come from? I spoke to a friend of yours this afternoon. Who is that? Dr. Hardiman from Cincinnati. <laughs> Jeffrey Hardiman. He was our family doctor. That's what he said. And he was absolutely my patron saint when I decided to go to medical school. Is he here? No, I called him. How did you happen to do that? Well, Polly told me where you had interned, and that hospital had his name on one of your recommendations. Oh, and what is this? Did you know Wynne's mother? No, she died before we met. Do you know how she died? Of course he does. I, I've told him. It was a blood disorder. Yes, and according to Dr. Hardiman, very long and in the end very painful. He said he thought it was one reason why you had decided to become a hematologist. That had something to do with it, yes. I don't understand. Why were you asking questions about Wynne's mother? Well, I thought I just might possibly explain some things. I um, also spoke to the chief of staff at the hospital here. And so? He said that it's quite true that you were on duty all day, the day that Ruth Ann died. Was there a question? He also told me that you spend most of your afternoons working in your lab, alone. That's true so that it would have been possible for you to have been gone for an hour without anyone knowing. Now, wait just a moment. I didn't want to believe that this is where you were going, Owen. Blair, you know what my responsibility is. What the hell is this? You're supposed to be a lawyer. Do you honestly believe you can prove what you're suggesting? No. Owen, I think you'd better get out of here. I'm not really worried about proving it. Obviously. You think this is the way to defend Clark, by making idiotic accusations? I'm not worried because I don't think I'm going to have to prove it. Am I, Wayne? Wynne doesn't know what you're talking about. Yes, she does. No, she doesn't. I don't believe that she intends to keep quiet. Not anymore. Oh, and I promise you, the Bar Association is going to hear about this. Wynne, I think it's possible to understand the effect of your own mother's death. Seeing her die a little at a time. And then facing the thought that you're going to have to go through it again. With someone that you loved as much as you did, Ruth Ann. But now someone else's life is at stake. Clark. And don't say anything. It was even harder than with my own mother. Because this time, I was medically trained. And still, there was nothing I could do to relieve that suffering. Nothing. Except one thing. Where did you get the drugs? I'm a doctor. I simply wrote a prescription. Then I went to the house and I had a lovely quiet visit with her and then I you let them blame Clark Blair all I can do is try to explain to you at the time I didn't even let myself think of the consequences I just knew that I had to do it afterwards as, as it turned out Rachel didn't see me and and I, I just assumed that, that they would write it 
up as, as a suicide, and I thought that would be best for all. And then just as I began to realize that Clark was in serious danger, I... You found out you were pregnant? Is that how you came to me? I couldn't figure out who would let an innocent man take the blame. And that gave me an answer. Don't you see, everything changed then. Ruth Ann's first grandchild, I, life literally continuing. It, it, it was like God w was, was giving me a sign that, that he had forgiven me. I couldn't let that child be born in prison, Blair. I just couldn't. Not even at the cost of what it did to Clark. Maybe God is reacting after all. Maybe that's why I lost the baby. Winnie, please don't say anymore. Afterwards, when I saw the reaction of the family, your determination to live those last days with her, no matter what the pain, I saw that what I did was so wrong. It wasn't merciful at all. It was cruel. It was selfish. It was, it was just a result of, of my own terror at, at going through all of that again. I can only pray that someday God will forgive me. I realize that you never can. determined to plead guilty. It's her choice. Will she go to prison? Oh, of course. She'd make a good parole candidate when the time comes. Yes, I'd agree with that. Still, she can't practice medicine anymore. She hasn't got anything left. I think you're wrong, Frida. She'll have the love and support not only of Blair, but of the whole family. That's a lot, because that's some family. Yes, that's some family. This is Mr. T, cordially inviting you to join Hannibal, Howling Mad Murdoch, Face Man, and me in the A-Team, coming up next, right here in TV Land.
Ask him a lawyer. His own worst enemy. The jury are going to ask themselves, would I buy real estate from that man? I wouldn't buy a bag of peanuts from that man. But everybody's entitled to a good defense. Um, we got a telegram today. We did? Well, you did. You have been nominated by the Community Fund Committee as a candidate for the Man of the Year Award. <laughs> they must be having trouble. 